I think over the years as a believer in Christ, one of the most surprising things to me is how much it meant to be a part of a community. How much it meant to have a place to belong. I, 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 knew, I knew that I had sinned. I knew that I needed forgiveness. I had come to a place where I believed that God existed. I came to a place where I understood that Jesus was the manifestation of that existence to give me a relationship with him. But I never really understood, never really grasped how much it would mean to me to be a part of community, what, how much it would mean to me to be a part of a church. And yet Peter's addressing new believers, Christians who are in an atmosphere where it's hostile towards Christianity, and in the midst of all the great things he says about salvation, one of the things he drives home in 1 Peter chapter 1 is how important it is to be a part of community. How if we're going to thrive, if we're going to flourish, if we're really going to go somewhere with our faith, if we're going to do something of lasting value with our lives, it is probably most likely and probably best and most effectively going to be experienced through church, through community. And, I'm, and I'm, you know, we hesitate to use those words. The word church can have a lot of negative connotations. If you grew up in church, when I say it, church, you're hearing your mom say to you, hurry up get going. We got to get to church. And so that may not be the most positive expression. But church in the New Testament describes the people who have had a relationship with God, who have established that relationship with God, who have experienced that faith in Him that has changed their lives. And so it's a very dynamic word in our scriptures to remind us of how much God loves us, how God is working in us and through us in the context of community, living out our faith together. Let's look at 1 Peter. Let's go to chapter 1. Let's go to verse 22. And let's see what Peter says about this community and some attributes of this community that I think quite honestly help us grasp how significant, how, how meaningful it means to be a part of a church. Peter's writing this letter to these Christians and he says in verse 22, what is our numbering system, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly. Because you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And he quotes Isaiah chapter 8 and says, for all flesh is like grass, all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel, that word that means simply good news, the message of Christ. This is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. When he's talking about community, he's talking about living out our faith together. He's talking about flourishing and thriving in our faith through community, through church. And it's an elevated community. It's unlike any other organization you know, I think that was one of the things that surprised me and has become meaningful to me. There is no other organization in existence like the church. You can join clubs. You can join fraternities or sororities. You can graduate from a university and become a part of an alumni organization. There are lots of things you can belong to. Lots of places you can go. Lots of relationships you have. But Peter says this community, this flourish community, this thriving community is unique because the very nature of how we got in, how we qualified, why we're apart. He says in verse 22, since you have purified yourselves by obedience to the truth. The word truth here is the New Testament word that literally means gospel. It is like the all-encompassing aspect of faith related to knowing Jesus Christ. And so the truth is not just the tenets of law or, or commands or, or moral restrictions or, or moral guidelines. It is the all-encompassing truth that comes out of God's love for his people demonstrated in Jesus, Jesus' death on the cross, the forgiveness that's available through that death, Jesus' resurrection, his victory, his power over death itself. That is the truth in, a, in an all-encompassing way. That purification of our hearts is actually the experience of conversion. 
He will, he will say later in this exact same passage in verse 23, because you have been born again. It is our new relationship with Christ that now enables us to experience this community. So it's an elevated community. And I don't mean to be dismissive or, or, or potentially in any way marginalize anybody else, but there is just no other group like it. No matter how kindred your spirits are, there is nothing like a place that the New Testament calls the church, this community where we experience because we have experienced the life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be a Christian to come to church. Actually, ideally, if you're thinking about spiritual things, church should be the best place to come and discover and inquire and ask your questions. But to truly belong, you have to have this relationship with Jesus through faith, as a result of God's grace, you know Jesus, and as a result, you know one another. And that's why Scripture uses words like the family of God to describe this unique relationship. There is just, quite honestly, nothing else like it. This is the only organization of this kind of stature. An organization is all-inclusive. Yes, we have a specific organization in our ministry, a specific place in our ministry, but that's really not the concept. The concept is this fellowship, this partnership, this relationship that happens. And it happens because Jesus changed our lives, and now we come together, and we worship, and we mature, we grow, we, we're involved in projects and events and ministries that touch other people's lives because we're living out the reality of our faith in this elevated community, this God-ordained, this God-called community we call church. Since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other. It's an engaging community. It is something that we participate in and we live out our faith. And, and we're going to use several kind of sub points to just describe that. I think there is a sense of, of both connectedness and compassion and caring in this unique community, in this unique place we call church. The compassion is open to any and every individual. It's what you experience when you show up at a good church, at a healthy church. When you show up at that healthy church and you're greeted and you're welcomed and it seems like the people are genuinely happy to see you. It's because they're a compassionate people. How can we remain in any way discompassionate? How can we remain unconcerned about people when we recognize that our transformation has happened because Jesus loved us enough to come here? We function out of the foundation of God's love. And so, yes, strategically, we have ministries that are designed to help people connect and experience that compassion. We have greeters ministries, we have, we have care ministries, we, we have small group ministries where you can connect at a small level. We have, have all types of different ministries strategically, but it all comes back to this foundation. God loved us, and so we're going to love one another. And Peter's telling the church, when you're together, when you're living out your faith, sincerely, constantly, earnestly, deeply love one another. Have compassion. Be glad to see one another. Be glad that you're a part of something that is meaningful. Be glad you're a part of something that is divine and uniquely spiritual in nature. Be happy to, to be a part of something that caring and that loving. But compassion, I think, leads to in-depth caring. And that's, this is sustained compassion. Compassion may make me glad to see you. Compassion may make me concerned about your life. But caring takes the next step and says, I'm going to engage in your life. This is an engaging community. I'm going to participate in your life. And so if you're having great things, here is a safe place where you can express the pride of those great moments, where you can ask one another, how did it go at work this week? And if it was a good week, you can share that. And other people will celebrate with you where you can have good experiences within your family, with your kids or with your parents or in any type of relationship. And here's a place that will celebrate that with you. The caring community goes beyond just the initial understanding of God's love to the ability to literally care give. As we were singing this morning, 
I, I couldn't help but thinking one of our members, actually both are present in the service this morning. Um, recently I was at a, at a place and everybody kind of gathered together and, and one of our members was going through a really difficult time dealing with cancer issues and things like that. And another member had taken the lyrics to one of the songs we sang this morning and printed it up, framed it, and handed it to them. It's just an encouragement. They, while you're going through this, I want you to be encouraged. The person didn't recognize the song, and so they pulled it up on their phone. And that's when I walked up as they're sitting there listening to it. It's one of my favorite songs by one of my favorite bands. And, and, um, and I, but at the depth of that moment was not just that it was a great song, it was great lyrics, but that somebody cared enough to say, I know what you're going through is hard. And I'm going to walk through this with you. I'm going to care. Compassion recognizes the need. Compassion recognizes the hurt. Compassion recognizes the, the concern, the, the fear that comes with issues like cancer and other health problems. Caring says, let me go one step further and come into your life. Walk with you through this moment. I may not be able to heal this. I may not be able to do anything about it. But you're not going to go through this alone. And whether it's a celebration or whether it's an actual catastrophe, we don't want to go through it by ourselves. I want people praying for me. I want people engaging with me. It's an engaging community where compassion rules the day and caring is lived out each and every moment in its own small ways. And it's a connected community. An engaging community is connected. There's compassion, there's caring and concern, but there's a relationship. You belong to something that is significant. And you belong to that with other people. And I think that's what Peter's getting at when he says, look, in this relationship, show sincere brotherly love, family type love. And this is healthy family. This is not dysfunctional family. This is not, this is not the family that makes the sitcoms or the reality TV shows. This is real family that cares and says, I am committed to a deep relationship with you. And no matter what happens, we're going to live out that relationship. We're not always going to agree, but we're going to manage past the disagreements. We're not always going to see things exactly the same, but yet the community is growing and, and we can look at things from different perspectives and I can learn and you can learn and we can grow. This is the, this is the kind of com community that is connected with one another to a degree that they're family. And with family, for the most part, and except for really severe circumstances, you live through that experience, you go through and you work through it together. It's, it's a place it's a place to belong. That's how we sincerely love one another. That's how we earnestly love one another. That's how we deeply love one another. And, and, it, and it carries on. And it goes on for a long period of time. Because actually it's not just simply a matter of, of being engaged in the community. It's not simply a matter of recognizing that this community is unique in its nature and stature because God is the orchestrator. He is the organizer of this community because it's, a, it's an enduring community. Look at what he says in verse 23. Because you have been born again, because you've experienced the relationship with God, because you believed in Jesus, Jesus changed your life, you're now a part of something that's going to outlast you, quite honestly. Because you have been born again, not a perishable seed, but imperishable. In other words, Peter recognizes we tend to define life by our physical existence. But the church, this, this community that we want to flourish and thrive in, it exists beyond those physical boundaries. You were born not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Eight centuries before this, Isaiah had prophesied and said, the very nature of the word of God is such that it will always last. And that's what Peter quotes. All flesh is like grass and it's glory. The, the pride of the moment, the, the celebration of the moment, that glory is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This community will last. It's amazing to me. You can look at the history of the church. You can study it technically in school, or you can just casually glance at it yourself. You can look at the history of the church, and you have all kinds of periods of history where bad decisions were made, poor choice, choices were made throughout the entire history of the church, universal. And a lot of times people settle on one of those darker moments and say, but look, how can the church be a reflection of God's love? Because look at how the church behaved in this period of history. That's because we're, we're not saying that the church is perfect. We're saying that the church is enduring. And there's a huge difference. The truth is, 
I believe, and I've said this before, some of you have heard it, one of the greatest testimonies to the grace of God is the fact that the church still exists. If you can make a bad decision, it'll happen in church. I was thinking, you know, the proverbial joke that used to go around, you know, how many, how many Aggies does it take to change the light bulb? None, just invite somebody from UT to come do it. I mean, you know, those types of things, just teasing, just teasing. You know, I, mean, I was thinking the other day, I thought, and I don't know why I thought this. This is one of those weird random thoughts you have when you're driving. I thought, I wonder how many Baptists it takes to change the light bulb. I came to the conclusion if it went to committee, the light bulb would never get changed. <laughs> I mean, we can make bad decisions. We make poor choices. The, the nature of the institution of the church doesn't show its enduring, enduring quality. But in all of the history of the world, in every period of time, in Peter's time, it was Nero and the Roman Empire. And, and they're saying the church is not valid. Let's persecute it. Let's, let's literally, the goal is to wipe out Christianity. And yet the church thrived during that period of intense persecution. Everybody can criticize the church. We, we live in a period of history when repeatedly since about the 1960s, there have been sociologists who have been saying the church has come to the end of its run but the church is still here. And in some of the worst possible environments around our world today, globally, the church is thriving and growing at miraculous rates because the church is an enduring church because it's built on the foundation of the Word of God. The participants are people who have been eternally changed and transformed by the Word of God, the acceptance of Jesus as the Word, as the truth. And that isn't going to endure. We're, we're going to exist and live together in community long after this life is over with. And again, I'm not, you know, everything else will change. The, the, the music will change. If you become a part of the church and you stay a part of a ministry um, and you live out your faith in the context of community, everything's going to change. The way you dress and come to church will change. The way, the way you look at church will change. Facilities will change. Geographic locations will change. All of those things are a part of this world. But the transformation, that born again, that new experience that happens when you believe in Jesus, Jesus forgives you of your sin, secures you with his righteousness for all eternity, that part's going to continue to last. We're, we're going to be together forever. Avoid the temptation of looking around at this moment and thinking, I'm not so sure I like that idea. But we're, the good part is in heaven, everybody's perfect. And so the bad choices and the bad decisions, the, 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 the negative experiences just simply aren't going to carry over into eternity. This is an enduring organization, not because of its structural build or because of its leadership or because of the, the networking nature of it or the infrastructure, but because God is the very author of it. It's built on the Word of God. That's why we teach the Word of God. That's why Every time when we come together in our small groups and our Bible studies, our focus, our priority is the Bible because the Bible will last. We're not going to last. Our opinions aren't going to last, but the Scripture lasts, and the Scripture always points to Jesus who gives us the ability to have forgiveness and new life and last with Him. It's, it's an enduring community. You know, and, and it, we, we, we tend to think so much in terms of our own parameters, you're a part of, we're a part of a legacy church. Our church is a legacy church. This month, you may or may not be aware of it. This month, our church is 110 years old. And no, I wasn't the pastor when it founded. <laughs> 110 years in this specific locale, in this specific, not even actually in this particular piece of property, but in this area, ministering to people. And I, I think that's a great thing. I am proud of that. That doesn't, and, and quite honestly, in spite of some of our cultural things that are happening, it doesn't make us irrelevant because we're old. It actually, if anything, it makes us stable. I mean, it should say something. I mean, you, you see the commercials just like I do all the time. Something's valuable. Something, something is trustworthy because it was established at some date prior than today. But we're 110 years. Am I, am I saying we're perfect? Am I saying we're mature? Am I saying where we need to be? Absolutely not. It's 110 years of bad decisions, poor leadership, and all kinds of other issues throughout time. Disagreements and arguments. Because we're family. But we're still here. And guess what? I believe we'll be here after you and I are gone. 
Everything is possible, has the possibility of change, but God has set the, the actions in motion. It's an enduring community, and we get to be in heaven. I'm at a point in my Christian walk where just basically all the mentors in my life are no longer alive. They're no longer around. But that doesn't mean they're out of my life. Their influence is still a part of my life. And I'm going to get to see them again because they were believers and they influenced and they mentored me, they discipled me, whatever terminology you want to use to describe that growing, maturing relationship. Because it was foundationally in their relationship with Christ, it is foundationally a relationship that's going to last and I will get to see them again. They're today a part of that great cloud of witnesses that Hebrews 12 refers to, and they're watching, and they're cheering, and they're supporting, and they're encouraging. It's an enduring community. So it's, a, it's an elevated community. It's unlike anything else. It's an engaging community. In other words, we participate and we, we get involved in one another's lives in a positive way. I mean, there are some things, you know, that, you know we can get involved in one, or, one of those lives in negative ways and be a little bit too concerned sometimes and cross boundaries, but we don't want to do that. But it's, we, we do want to be engaged. We want to be involved with one another. And it's an enduring, lasting community. And what I love about it is it's an expansive community. If you look at the very last verse in verse 25, Peter says, and this word, referring back to the word of God, which refers to the gospel that he references in verse 25, which is the, the message of Jesus Christ. This word is the gospel, the good news, that message of hope that was proclaimed to you. Here's why I call it an expansive community. Somebody experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus. They shared that with me and invited me to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus. I made the decision to believe in Jesus and I let, by my faith, opened my heart to God and said, come in and be a part of my life, forgive me of my sins. And Jesus began to change me and I experienced that life-changing relationship and now I have the opportunity to share it with somebody else. It's constantly growing. It's constantly moving out. And, and that's a good thing. I mean, there are some dip difficulties with growth. We're, we're going to have one of those Sundays where everybody's just a little bit uncomfortable. In two weeks, we're going to do a Together Sunday. And on Together Sunday, we combine all of our activities into one place, knowing in advance that there's a train wreck involved. So all of our Bible studies and small groups that meet on Sunday will meet during one hour. All of our classrooms across the campus are utilized by multiple groups in multiple hours. And now we're going to ask all of them to join and combine together which means different groups, different teachers are going to have to figure out who's going to teach that day, who's going to bring the food, who's going to make sure the coffee is made. Um, and they're not all of the same demographic. And so older people will be meeting with younger people. And we know, we know this is going to stress everybody. We know there's not going to be room in some of the classes. We, we understand there are more problems inherent with a together Sunday than any other activity that we could possibly do. But we feel like it's valuable every once in a while throughout the year to just push the threshold of comfort and say, let's all get together. Regardless of our age, regardless of our background, regardless of who's in charge, who's leading, let's all get together. If it's one big mass chaotic moment, that's okay because we'll be doing that chaotic moment all together. Worship services will all be in one hour that Sunday. So the, some who come to earlier service, they're going to come and find out we're not having service yet, and they're going to wait around or go to a Bible study group that's packed out with people. You're going to have troubles getting seats in here. Every time we do this, we have troubles getting seats in here. At some point, we'll have to do together Sundays in a different venue because we won't be able to have it. But in the midst of all that chaos, in the midst of all these things happening, I rarely ever hear anybody say to me, I hate the fact that it's so crowded. In fact, I was thinking earlier I have never heard anybody come to a service and show me their newborn baby, which happens a lot. I mean, I'm the pastor and people want me to see their newborn babies. Um, I just was visiting with some of our crew over here and they, they were showing me pictures of a baby and they were saying all these things about the baby and, and I didn't know what else to say and they'll validate this. This is what I said. I said, looks like a baby. I mean, I just, you know, but nobody said to me, oh, I'm so, you know, I've never seen anybody bring me a newborn and say, you know, we're really happy about this baby, but we really wanted a family of two. We didn't really want the family to grow. 
Definitely when it comes to grandparents. I have never had a grandparent walk up to me and say, hey, did you hear my kids had a baby? And I said, well, yeah, I've heard about it. And, and well, you know, we're, we're kind of glad the baby's healthy. We're glad the baby's okay. But we really wanted our family to be small. We don't want a big family. Don't have any more grandkids. I mean, I've never heard a grandparent say that. It's like suddenly the more the merrier. I mean, in everyday life, most of us don't complain about growth. I mean, if you, get a, if you get a promotion this year and you get an increase in your salary, do you look at your employer? Do you look at your supervisor and say, you know, that's nice that you want to do that, but I was really content. I don't think I need any more. An expansive community wants to share. And that's what, I believe that's what Peter is, is acknowledging. Yes, this is all happening because somebody shared the word. Somebody proclaimed this to us. We responded. We met Jesus. And now we have the privilege of doing the same thing all over again. Somebody invited me to experience a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Now I have the opportunity to leave out of the physical church and be the church each and every day, reflecting the love of God in all the places I go, inviting people at work, in my neighborhood, in my relationships, sometimes in my family, and all kinds of the other organizations I'm a part of to experience that life-changing relationship with Jesus. And I'm just doing this one conversation at a time. I'm just sharing with them something that was shared with me. And the net result is the church grows. Every time a believer, every time somebody makes the decision to be a believer, the church grows. The family of God grows. And I personally don't think there's limitations in heaven. I think we're all going to fit in just fine. That's the love God has for us. And we get to participate in it. We get to participate in something that is so beyond anything else in this world, the elevated community of the church that God designed and God put into motion as a result of his people trusting him and knowing him, his children gathering together. We get the opportunity to be engaged in that community, love one another, care for one another, meet one another's needs, help one another, do the things that are necessary as a part of being that active community. And we get, the, we get the knowledge of knowing it's, it makes a difference and it makes an eternal difference. I'm a part of something that's going to last. I belong to something that will go well beyond my lifetime. And it can grow. It can expand. There's room for everybody. Because we're not talking about physical boundaries. We're talking about the entrance into the family of God. This community where we flourish, where we thrive. And anyone and everyone can make that decision, know Jesus, and become a part of this community. And again, not just us, the community of faith that exists globally and it exists beyond history and exists into the future because it is the eternal, infinite reflection of an eternal, infinite God. This is the community in which we thrive.